Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You are that word, Lord Jesus. May you come, proclaim yourself afresh this morning in the midst of a tumultuous and divisive time. May your clarity and your healing and your peace permeate this place and your people. For we ask this expectantly in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. So guess what we're going to preach on? The book of Hebrews. Almost every single one of you, not anyone, said Matthew. So I, I took that as, okay, maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me something through God's people. So we're going through the book of Hebrews. And so if you've got your Bible or your phone or your bulletin, please go ahead and turn there as we'll be going through it. And for next week in preparation, go ahead and read Hebrews chapter 2. Very exciting book and a very uh, rewarding book as I studied through it and uh, pray that it will be a blessing to us all now as we enter in to hear the Lord's word. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. <laughs> so those are lofty words. Some of the highest Christology in all of God's word. So let me ask a question to start our time. Is there anything better in your life or in your mind than Jesus Christ? I think this is the question that the author goes back to throughout the, the epistle. Let me start with a perhaps less weighty question. Do any of you enjoy Christmas? Okay, you're like, can I answer this? Yes, no. I love Christmas, and you might be thinking, it's June, Matt. Isn't this a bit premature? But just wait for it. <laughs> Here's what we find. Christmas is glorious, isn't it? But, you know, a lot of the joy in Christmas comes in just getting ready for it. Am I right? All of the decorations, the wrapping of the presents. And some of you might be great gift givers out there. And you know how to wrap a present, right? And doesn't all of the pretty wrapping and the bows just add to the gloriousness of the season? Am I right? But how many of you have gotten a gift and wrapped it and got it ready and gave it to a child only to have that child become more excited about the box and the gift wrapping than they are about the actual gift? Anyone have that happened? Oh, I have. It's quite humorous. But the author of Hebrews is anxious that his audience not make the same mistake. You see, his original audience was composed of Jewish Christians, as indeed most of the earliest Christians were. But these followers of Christ were still surrounded by Jews who did not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. As a result, these early Christians would have received a lot of pressure from family, from friends, and from neighbors to turn back the clock, to abandon their support of Jesus, and to put their faith back into what God had revealed in the Old Testament through the law and the prophets. After all, the law wasn't just given by God, it came in splendid wrapping. Because as we are told, Moses received it as delivered by angels. That's why the author begins his argument by showing that we must not go back to an earlier stage of God's revelation. That is, we must not go back to the box and the wrapping paper. Because the box and the wrapping paper, that was all preparation, excitement for the ultimate gift, the ultimate word that he would reveal to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Instead, again, we must lift to the gift itself which is Jesus Christ. And to prove his point, the author goes back to the Jewish scriptures. 
And he demonstrates that the Messiah was always intended to be superior to everything else. Superior to the law, to the prophets, and yes, even to angels. And as we come to this opening chapter, we are greeted with three questions. Who is Jesus? What are angels? And why is Jesus better? So the first question, who is Jesus? Well, this is what we read in verse 3. Look, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. In the Old Testament, when Moses began to lead the people of God out of slavery in Egypt, something appears. At first, it's in the burning bush. But later, it comes in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then when the Egyptians and Pharaoh sought to recapture the Israelites, you know, they're charging after them. But the pillar comes in between the Israelites and the Egyptians, and they cannot pass through it. Later, when this appearance, this fiery thing came down on Mount Sinai, there was thunder and lightning, and no one could go on the mountain without dying. When the temple was being dedicated under Solomon, down came this same glory cloud, the fiery presence. And when it came down, everyone who was in the temple fell to the ground, and they could not get up. Well, why? Because it was God coming down in a form that they could see. His earth-shattering brilliance, beauty, and overwhelming presence. But here in the beginning of Hebrews... We are being told that Jesus is the ultimate and final word of God here in human form. And it says he is the exact imprint of God's nature and nothing is greater than him. That's what it says in verse 3. This is also what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you've studied it, you remember that is where he talks about Moses. And you remember when Moses came down from uh, Mount Sinai. He was radiating the glory of God. And did they like seeing God's glory? Remember what they told him to do? To veil his face. You remember that? Well, as Paul goes on to describe in 2 Corinthians 3.14, he says, For to this day, when Jews read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Well, how so? What is being said here? Well, just think for a moment of a person that you admire greatly for their humility, for their kindness, and for their confidence. Now, when you spend time with that person and you watch them interact with others, I don't know about you, but I can feel very embarrassed when I compare how they treat others with how I treat others. Anyone ever had that happen before? But being around that person makes you want to be a better person. And in actuality, in being around that person, you begin to be changed. While you are gazing at the goodness in their lives, that goodness begins to pass into you. But how can we do this with God? I mean, we cannot look at the sun without our eyes being destroyed. How much less can we look and behold the glory of God without being destroyed, like all of the Old Testament shows us. But with Christ, we find the form of God's glory that we can relate to, that we can have a relationship with, that we can have the veil removed from our eyes, that we can become just like him. It is only through Christ that we can become the person we know we ought to be. For it is in Christ we find the best an ultimate form in which God has revealed himself. We know this truth because of Jesus' claims. Do you ever just read through the Gospels and just become astonished by some of the stuff that Jesus says? Remember that time in Luke chapter 10 when the disciples come back and they're excited because they were casting out demons? In our Gospel reading today, remember Jesus gave them authority to do that. Well, they're sitting there talking about it, and Jesus says, I saw Satan fall fall from heaven like lightning. What? Did you just hear what he said? I mean, think about this. They're talking about demons, and he was all like, yeah, you know, I was there before, you know, the created material universe, and I saw Satan go bad. (laughs) What a sight. (laughs) 
Who is this guy? Matthew 23, verse 34. Jesus is teaching the people. And he says, I keep sending you wise men, teachers, and prophets. Wait, what? What? He, no, what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I am a wise man, I am a prophet, I am a teacher. No, he says, I am the force behind the universe that has been sending the wise men, the prophets, and the teachers. <laughs> what? Do you see this? Do you see his claims? Go back to any of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, I don't care. You go back to any of them, and when they talk, they say, thus saith the Lord. In other words, they're saying, I don't want to say this. And you, you who have studied this, you realize that many of them didn't want to prophesy for God because they're like, I'm going to die as soon as I prophesy. And they, they want to make clear, this is not my word. This is the Lord's word. But when you read the words of Jesus, never does he stoop so low. The only thing you ever hear Jesus say is truly, truly, I say unto you. Jesus Christ's consciousness of being the transcendent, uncreated, and beginningless God of the universe permeates everything he says and does. It's on every page of every gospel. Well, what does it mean? It, it means that we cannot put him on the shelf. We cannot relegate him and say, well, he was just a good teacher. He was a good moral man. No, I think N.T. Wright put it best. And you've heard this quote before, but it's worth repeating. How can you live with the terrible thought that the hurricane has become human, that fire has become flesh, that life itself became alive and dwelt among us? Christianity means either that or nothing, either the most devastating disclosure of the deepest reality in the world, or it's a sham, a nonsense, or a bit of deceitful play-acting. Most of us, unable to cope with saying either of those things, condemns ourselves to live in the shallow world in between. Now, I think he's absolutely right. When we see Jesus make those claims, we are left with only two options. He is either a wicked deceiver, and he deserved what he got, or he, in fact, was Lord of all, and we should throw ourselves at his feet and say, command us. There is no middle ground. He didn't, he didn't leave us any. Now, right now, many of you might be thinking, well, that's a bit narrow, right? And is this not what we hear in the Western world? It says you can't say those narrow things. You have to understand that all religions are really the same. And to say anything else is intolerant. Do you know what they are doing when they make such a statement? They are being narrow. They are saying, you can't do that. You've got to follow what I'm saying. But you see, what matters is not being narrow. We're all being narrow. What matters is the truth. And so the question is, is what is the truth? And what did Jesus say in John 14, 6? I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the unique Son of God that even angels bow and worship. Which brings us to our second question. What are we to make of angels? Well, angels are messengers. We know this because of the Hebrew word for which angels is translated from, and it's Malek. Malek literally translated means messenger. We see many of these messengers or angels in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Genesis. They are found in the New Testament as well. I mean, you remember when Joseph found that his betrothed, not even married to her yet, she's pregnant. Remember this, Mary? Hey, we're talking about Christmas, right? <laughs> and he seeks to quietly divorce her because he's a righteous man. He's like, man, what in the world? And who comes to him? An angel, a malik, a messenger. You see this? And he says, don't, don't, don't divorce her, for the son that she will bear is Emmanuel, God with us. And they will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. And of course, at the end of Matthew's gospel, after the resurrection, they go to the tomb. And who is in the tomb? An angel. And he delivers another message. Jesus is risen. Why do you look for the dead? 
Or why do you look for the, uh, the living among the dead? A message. Do you see this? So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see angels delivering God's messages to God's people. So why does the author spend so much talking, time talking about these angels? And why make the point that Jesus is superior to them? I mean, modern readers will look at chapter 1 and they'll be like, this is a bit of overkill here, right? I mean, a whole chapter, you know, really showing that he's better than angels? Well, I think at the very most, the author was addressing the false notion that Jesus was only another messenger, like an angel. Evidently, that could have been taking place. There was one commentator that was certain of it. And at the very least, the author of Hebrews was saying that Jesus' message was superior to that which was delivered by angels. And if God's people listened obediently to the word that was delivered by angels... Well, then how much more should they listen to the word that was delivered by God himself? This is fascinating. If you go back and check me on this, according to Deuteronomy 33, 2, angels were present with God when he delivered the law. Stephen pointed this truth out in Acts 7, 53. Again, check me out on this. When it's right before he was martyred. And the apostle Paul says the exact same thing in Galatians 3, 19. Hence, if they believe the law that was delivered in part by angels, how much more should they believe the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel, which was delivered by God in the flesh? Do you see the point the author of Hebrews is trying to tell us here? Then as now, people have held unbiblical ideas about angels. And while we are not to ignore their existence, we should not adore them either. Furthermore, in stating that Christ is superior to angels, the author is again emphasizing the superiority of Christ's message. In verse 1, we read that at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Now, the Greek word polymeros is translated here many times. And literally, it means pieces or piecemeal. That is, God spoke to us in bits and pieces, in piecemeal, through the law and the prophets. But now God has revealed to himself in the full, in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if it would be folly to turn back from the gospel of Jesus Christ to the piecemeal revelation of the law and the prophets. He goes on to make this point in verses 6 through 14, by stating seven, really proclaiming seven Old Testament passages. Now, just let me stop you right there. Seven? Now, the author is writing to Jewish Christians. Now, why would the number seven be important to Hebrews? Anyone know? It's the number of perfection, isn't it? So it's not an accident that he writes it, which leads us to our final question, which is, why is Jesus better? And he gives us seven reasons why he is perfectly better. Now, we don't have time to go over all those seven uh, quotations, but we're going to look at two of them. So first, in verses 8 and 9, the author quotes Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Now, Psalm 45 is a breathtaking passage because it addresses the king in that passage as if he were God. You see this. Look at verse 8. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This God king rules sovereignly and brings about righteousness and justice throughout the earth. And what is more, at the end of Psalm 45, in verse 17 of that psalm, it says that people begin and continue to praise him forever and ever. You only do that with God. And that's what we find. So here's what we're with. Or here's what the question is before us. Does our world yearn for justice? Is the media not filled with accusations for who they know are the guilty party? Is that not what we're seeing before our eyes right now? One of the messages of Hebrews is that God is right now bringing an end to evil. And both the psalmist and the author of Hebrews are in agreement. Peace will be brought about not through angels and not through any other means, 
but only through the anointed Messiah King, which is Jesus Christ. Do you see this? Well, second, and in my mind, the most clinching argument for Christ's superiority is found in verse 13, which highlights the fact that Christ is now ruling on his throne. That Christ rules supreme is proven by a verse that is quoted more times in the New Testament than any other Old Testament passage, some 14 times. Jesus even quoted it and applied it to himself when he was on trial in Mark 12, verse 36. Of course, this is Psalm 110.1, which is quoted here in verse 13 where the author asks the rhetorical question, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? The answer, of course, is a resounding none, not one. For all, as the author of Hebrews wants us to see, no one and nothing compares to Jesus Christ. Now, I know, many of you out there might be thinking, well, this, is, this doesn't really apply to us, right? Because not many of the people that we know are converting from Christianity, Christianity to Judaism. But many, including those within the church, seem dissatisfied with the gift that they have been given in the person of Jesus Christ. As a result, we see people become distracted by other things, be they angels, demons, or whatever the world has to be or seems to be highlighting at that time. Okay, I have to break from my sermon here and and, uh, do true confessions with your priest, okay? I was debating about this uh, all through my sermon preparation. But I'm being very distracted right now by the news, I read widely in the news. I read, uh, I read both ends of the spectrum. I'm a news junkie. My wife will tell you, that's one of the things that I love doing. I just like seeing what's going on in the world. And I don't even just read what's going on in America, right? I, I read all over the place. But recently, I've had to say, I've got to put this down. And I don't know if any of you can empathize with me, but right now, there is rhetoric coming forth from both sides that is very damaging, and very distracting. And I was finding myself consumed with all of this. And then I read Hebrews. And I'm forced to ask the question, is there anything in your life more important than Jesus? Are you consumed with anything more than Jesus? And I thought, man, you know, I'm getting down in the dumps just by reading the news and just seeing the vitriol that is going back and forth, back and forth. And Jesus says, don't be consumed by that. Don't fear the world, for I have overcome the world. And so what it tells me is that instead of being consumed by what I see in the news and the media, is I need to be consumed by the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Is that true for us? Is that true for me? It has to be so. Otherwise, we are just going to be in the thick of it, just like the rest of the world. And do we want to be in the thick of it? No. Jesus is pulling us out. He's pulling us out of weariness into his rest. And the shalom, the rest, the peace of God is only found in one place. And that is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the question before us is, are you going to get distracted by the gift wrapping, the box of this life? the material world or the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, are you going to see the glorious gift that has been given to us in the person of Jesus Christ? We must pay closer attention to who Jesus really is, to the role he played and is still playing because he is reigning from on high, and to the life of worship and service that he has called each and every one of us to. For he is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. For it is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And in your word, you are giving us a warning and an encouragement to not get distracted by the things of this world, but to be consumed 
with you, Lord Jesus. May that be true for me and your whole church as you expand your kingdom and continue to kick in the gates of hell here in Avondale to the ends of the earth. We lift you up and we give you the praise for, Lord, you alone deserve the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed.